So I think we can start. So thank you very much for the invite. So uh, the title of my talk is Adopting Java for the Serverless World. First of all, I assume that you are all, yeah, Java developers have, have experience with Java, but who, who has experience with the AWS cloud provider? Okay, only several people who has experience with the serverless services within the AWS cloud provider. Okay, approximately the same amount. Okay, we have the kind of mixer situation. So I will try just to, to explain stuff for those who are not aware of AWS cloud or, and so on. But yeah, my name is Vadim and I'm um, Ukrainian native. So it's a very difficult situation for my country and also uh, to present. But anyway, uh, I lived half of my life in Ukraine. Now I'm living half of my life in Germany and I have two passions, Java and serverless on AWS. I'm part of the AWS Community Builders program also in the area of the serverless where I also share my knowledge. And uh, I'm working for the company called IP Labs in Bonn, Germany. We are 100% subsidiary of the Fujifilm Europe and we offer the, the, the software for creating and purchasing of the photo products like calendars, photo book of the year, prints, posters, gifts, so everywhere where you can print your photos um, on multiple platforms. And uh, we did a lot of uh, for the cloud transformation in the last uh, four years, completely closing all, all our data center and, and, and went, went all in with LWS cloud, where we have kind of mixed situation, classical infrastructure, Docker infrastructure, but we try to do as much as possible with serverless services in the last year. And we had a bunch of very smart Java developers and just run in the situation that Java struggles kind of in the serverless world. And that's, that's the topic of, of my talk um, today. So let's start with the Java popularity. So there are a lot of sources uh, just to, to see how, how it develops uh, with different algorithms behind it, uh, like Stack Overflow questions, GitHub repositories, job posting, and so on. But this one is from, from Red Monk from the last year. And what, what you see here is um, that uh, since probably more than 10 years, Java is kind of between the place one and three, yeah, depending on the situation and nothing changes in, in, in this year. Currently it's in place three, but we can agree that it's the, 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 the place one. Uh, anyway, very popular programming language. Now we will go into AWS or cloud offering and then serverless offering and what we see in the AWS world. And I will take the perspective mainly from the AWS developers because I only have experience with this cloud provider. You see that situation is unchanged. AWS is on the top. We have, micro, uh, we have Microsoft, we have Google Cloud. They're kind of a bit behind. And then after this is a huge gap currently. And probably this year, the situation with the Gartner Magic Quadrant will uh, remain the same. Now, if we will ask uh, just to see the, the report, this is the, which is recently released two years ago, uh, two, two, two months ago, how many percent of the organization adopt serverless within each cloud provider? You see that AWS truly provides very strong offerings. So many uh, companies which use AWS cloud also rely on some kind of serverless services. You see more than 70% of the organization adopted in, in several ways. Yeah, the same situation you see Lambda is in the core of, uh, of the serverless services where you run, uh, write your business logic and you see that the amount of Lambdas invoked just increased a lot within the last year. Serverless is a, probably as all these terms is a bit overloaded, but anyway, event-driven architectures are really yeah, important ones. So we see that the adoption increased. Now we will look into the life of Java, serverless developer on AWS. And what we see, of course, Java 8 will be supported. They have Amazon Coretta. This is kind of something similar to adopt uh, OpenGDK. So this is adopt uh, OpenGDK alternative from Amazon. They currently even extended the long-term support for, for Java 8 until 2026. Whether it's good or bad, you can decide, but because if the companies cannot move, they probably will stuck forever and just you, you cannot extend. You can extend, but <laughs> it's not the solution. But anyway, there are reasons for that. 
Um, AWS also supports Java 11, also for Lambda, so you can select manage runtime Java 11, and this since 2019. And they only promise in the Amazon Coretta that uh, they only support long-term versions of Java, like well, then 17, and then it will be 23, and so on. So nothing in, in between. Currently, is also long-term support for Java 17 is released, but you cannot select manage runtime um, for Lambda Java 17. So there, are, there is only Java 11, but also Java 8, and so on. So probably we can all agree that the Java is very fast and in the execution at least, and very mature programming language. But if we will see on the serverless adoption, so how many companies select Java as a, as a programming language of your Lambda functions, you will find something similar like this. Yeah, so you see the adoption is something like 5%. Yeah, five, six percent. That's the survey for in the last year, but I think nothing changes uh, a lot. And then you see that Node.js and Python are way above. So uh, most companies who, who who rely on the serverless uh, services, uh, especially on Lambda, prefer these two languages. This was the question on this survey. Uh, here is also the percentage of the Lambda functions uh, from this year, um, and you see the Java is still still below <coughs> i think five percent um this is another survey from from this year how many uh, the percentage of the organization using these languages and you see only 14 percent of the organization who use serverless prefer java which means they select this language for probably not very critical workloads yeah so all of them use kind of python no js but java probably for not very sensitive workloads like tooling, like which there are no no spikes, uh, predictive uh, workload, and probably where the latencies doesn't matter too much. So that's why just the statistics shows 14%, but it's only for not very sensitive workloads in, in many cases. So generally the situation is many companies have Java developers, they go into the cloud, they see the benefits of the serverless itself, just allowing you to focus on your business logic, but only very few of this organization say, okay, we just our Java developers can write Java code on Lambda. So what are the challenges for this? And we will have just, there are two major of them, cold starts, which causes latencies. I will explain for those who don't know what it is, but also memory footprint for short living functions. Yeah, and it costs also, it, yeah, it, um, um, it's also cost related on AWS. Okay, um, now I will explain some basics of Lambda function, how we can write them on Java, especially for those who don't have experience there. And generally, if you just select your Lambda function, which is in the, yeah, in the, in the core of, of serverless services, first of all, what you need to select is just programming language. In this case, we will say Java 11, we just select name of our function. We have here also Java 8 somewhere, but um, it's not recommendable currently if you write new function to, to select something old. And then you have to select uh, how, much, how much memory you want to allocate to your function. Why is it important? And uh, you, the, the, you can select something between 128 megabytes until 10 gigabytes in 46 uh, megabyte steps. And what is important, and you see that it's written, that the, your function is allocated CPU proportional to the memory. So if you double your memory, you will get your CPU doubled. Yeah, so you cannot just configure this separately. And you will have only the complete CPU core if you kind of assign 1.8 gigabyte memory. Yeah, that will be important for, for, for other stuff. So if you select less memory, then you will only get fraction of the full CPU. So if you select, I would say, half of the gigabyte memory, you will have only 25% uh, of the CPU core and the just the, the execution speed. What's also important is that um, after, if you s um, allocate more than two gigabytes memory, kind of, then the second core will be activated and until 10 gigabytes, it will be then six cores at maximum. It makes only sense if your Lambda function takes um, advantage of parallel executing, yeah, so that you can do something with other cores. Otherwise, you just simply spend money for nothing. Yeah, you cannot parallelize and just um, doesn't make any sense. 
That's why most functions run with half of gigabyte or one gigabyte memory, because they are simple, they don't need to parallelize something and so on. So there are two possibilities how you can write, uh, three, but two major of them, how you can write Java code, uh, yeah, Lambda function. So f the first one here on the left side, you simply um, implement the AWS request handler interface with kind of input and output, uh, request or response. And then you have only this one method handle request where you put your business logic. Uh, so, yeah, and then you, you return the response. The, 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 the one important thing you, you have here, this context from, from AWS SDK. And I will show you what benefits it can bring you. Another possibility is here, then you can uh, simply implement Java 8 function interface. Yeah, then you have only the apply method and then no context, but you don't rely here on any AWS libraries. So it's plain code, it may be portable, so that's, there is nothing AWS specific here. But uh, this context object on the left side can give you some, some stuff. For example, I use logging logger, which is kind of injected, so I don't need to inject something. In case you need to debug where, why your Lambda function takes too much time and you need kind of yeah, um, points where the function spend time and you cannot debug it very efficiently in the cloud, you can um, print out kind of get remaining time in millis. So you, generally the Lambda function can run only for 15 minutes maximal, but you can say it just should time out after 30 seconds because it's just public facing and doesn't make any sense to wait so long. But then you see, okay, it takes longer, then you can kind of kind of debug with that stuff. So this is how we write Lambda function. It's also important to understand the challenges, uh, to understand also AWS Lambda pricing model. It will be similar probably for, for, for other cloud providers. You have generally two tiers, request tier and also duration memory tier, I would say. So the request tier is, simp is, is simple, just you pay $20 cents for million requests. So how, simply count how, much, how many times your Lambda functions are executed and then for millions of them you pay this amount. Duration tier is a bit more complicated than uh, this duration memory tier. So generally it depends on the architecture. Now you can select Previously, it was only x86. Now you can select also ARM architecture, and then you pay this amount for oh, sorry for one gigabyte second. Yeah, so this is amount that you pay for your function, which runs one second for one mega, uh, gigabyte memory selected. So in case you your function run one second and you selected half of a gigabyte, you will pay the half of that amount. So this is kind of the the situation. So this is the example how you can calculate this. Let's assume you have 1 million requests and you have this x68 architecture with half of a gig memory assigned. And we will assume, which is never the case, that each Lambda invocation takes 200 milliseconds, each, all, all million requests for the simplicity. Then you pay uh, for request tier $20 and for gigabyte seconds for memory duration tier $1.67. It will be also important when we will talk about the optimizations. So now should, let's come back to the challenges. That was how you can mm, develop, uh, write the code in the Lambda function, how the pricing works. Now let's talk about the, the, the first challenge, which is the call start. So in order to understand this, uh, you should understand the life cycle, how the function is invoked. So let's assume you deploy the completely new function in the cloud. So you upload the code. In case of AWS, it will be S3 bucket, simply the storage. And when you first time execute the, co uh, execute the function, the code should be downloaded, the environment should be started, JVM should start, and then the static initializer block of the Java class will be initialized, just standard Java stuff. These three steps are, call are called call starts. And the last step, when the kind of the business logic in this handler or apply method is executed, it's a warm start. Yeah. So first, first time you will have always call start, and then if you reuse the stuff, yeah, you reuse this container, then next time you will have warm start. But now let's let's look in this in this last three steps from the from the point how it, it goes. 
First, what does it mean to start execution environment? First of all, AWS starts Firecracker VM. This is kind of container orchestrator, like Kubernetes, but they have everything is their own. It's Firecracker VM. Then AWS Lambda environment will start GVM in case we select a Java as a managed uh, programming language. And then Java runtime loads an initialized handler class. Yeah, this static initializer block. What's very important to understand that this initial phase for this init phase, and it doesn't matter how much CPU we gave the function, you will receive full CPU access for up to 10 seconds. Yeah, it's very important because many functions don't use the full CPU access. Here you will receive this full CPU access, which also will be important for optimization because yeah, you can optimize the stuff only for, sen uh, for 10 seconds and it's also for free for managed runtimes. For Java 11, if you select Java 11, it will be for free. We will see we can select Docker and so on. Then you pay for the same, the same logic as I presented you, duration and memory. But that's kind of situation we, we should be aware of. The static initializer block is important. And then the last one is Lambda calls the handler method. Yeah, and then the business logic will be executed. So now, once again, about the call start. So what is it? So let's imagine you, you make the request to your Lambda API, and then the situation is that the container can only execute one function in the same time. So this is nothing that the container tries to execute as much as possible. So the one container, only one function in parallel. And then, so if... Now the situation is, do we have the warm container? Yeah, so the container which, which is sitting and waiting to execute, has done the job and so on. If so, yeah, then the, we will have the warm execution. If there is no warm container, and it may be the case that's the new function, for example, yeah, or we have we deployed new function and want to execute 10 of them in parallel immediately, then you don't have warm containers. Yeah, so then this container should be started, and then you have this call start. Code should be downloaded, uh, Firecracker VM starts GVM, then the static initializer block should, should run, only then uh, your business logic will run. Uh, so that's the situation with the call start, that if you don't have enough warm containers, then they will be started. And uh, another information which is important here, AWS releases these containers from time to time for the security reasons, for patching and so on. They don't publish how often does it happen, but the people measure that with container ID and then saw that uh, it happens between... So after one or two hours, the container will be released anyway. So that, that means that there are no warm containers running for days, so they will be released and you will have then the call start, probably, yeah, if you don't have any warm containers. So simply spoken, if you execute your functions and you pause for two hours, then you start to execute, so assume that there will, there will no, no warm containers, yeah, they will be released. So then you have another call start, and you see the steps that you will see what does it mean to have the call start. Now these are the statistics which probably explain why Java is not that popular, or JavaScript, Node.js, Python are more popular. This is nearly the empty Lambda function. And then you see the cold start of this for the Java as a programming language, and you see that we are kind of about uh, a bit below one second. Yeah, and you see that the Python and, and, and JavaScript are kind of below. Yeah, and this is the empty function. You don't, you have hello world there. We don't write such a stuff generally. Yeah, what we, what we do, so this is one second or below one second is just the very best happy case for Java but it can go significantly up because we have third-party dependencies. We use other AWS services in the serverless world. It will be NoSQL database, DynamoDB. It may be simple notification, simple queuing service, and so on. All that stuff needs to be packaged, instantiated, and it adds up to the call start as well. So what are other parameters or other dimensions of the call start? Artifact size. It also, it depends how much dependencies do we have. Yeah? third-party dependencies and so on. This is also the statistic, very difficult to understand, but anyway, you see here it was measured with very small package, with a large package, and with a larger package on the Abaja, where every dependency is yeah, extracted. So you have no, you don't have any jars within it, so every jar is extracted, and you have only one jar uh, with the code. What you will see here that these numbers are 
so the the call start goes up with um, with the package size and it doesn't matter if you use java 8 or java 11 currently there is no signal that java 11 is better but anyway the package size matters so you see here the values below one second for very simple hello world where you don't instantiate the stuff um, so we will see the best practices. So the first function which I wrote in Java and I used DynamoDB and I used API Gateway for the public facing um, stuff. And I didn't use any optimized, uh, op I didn't optimize because I didn't know. So the call start was something between 10 and 20 seconds using the DynamoDB, which is normal case. And that's of course, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not what we expect. Even if the call start happens only one time per 10 seconds, uh, 10,000 invocation, it still is impact somebody. Yeah, it just, you cannot say so 1.0% of, 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 uh, of request may take 10 or 20 seconds. So you will lose probably money. Yeah, so nobody will wait, nobody understands. Of, in case you can just rewrite your logic that you have asynchronous invocation and it may be different, but if you have somebody who is waiting for your response, it's just, uh, not very good. So let's see how we can optimize it. We can go down at least from these double digit seconds. So first of all, it's not new anymore. So um, AWS release SDKs for each programming language, also for Java, where you can just simply, um, yeah, simply use them to to call other AWS services like DynamoDB, SKS, SNS, and many people still rely on the older SDK version 1.0. Since several years, there is 2.0, and it's just with a lower footprint and even more modular in case you need to um, to call something outside of the world, HTTP call. Uh, then there is a possibility to to call the uh, to use the asynchronous um, uh, client, HTTP client, for this because you see that the standard client and Apache HTTP client and even Netty they add up. Um, also to the call starts because they initialize lots of stuff. The question is, it's very, it, it's normal, it's okay for the long running application, then if something will be initialized only one time, and then it runs for, for months. But in case of Lambda functions, which is long leaving, all this caching, it bites you. You don't want to have this, yeah? So it will, the, 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 the container will be released after two hours, and then, then the next container, uh, yeah, it should load again, and just that's that's native Apache and even standard client. They're optimized for for long running server applications. So uh, it's still not very perfect, but you see this um, asynchronous client. It reduces at least uh, this this call start in case you need to call something via HTTP. Uh, what's also impo uh, important that in the SDK 1.0 all dependencies to all existing AWS services with, uh, were bundled together. It doesn't matter if you wanted to use it or not, but with SDK 2.0, you can select what you would like to use. If you say, I only use DynamoDB, then you can only just declare this dependency. And it will reduce the artifact size because AWS provides probably SDKs for 200 services and just uh, you don't need them. Yeah, you need only one, two, depends on your function, but anyway, yeah. Um, and of course, if you see, have these dependencies like JUnit and so on, then declare them that the scope is test, yeah, then they won't be bundled, yeah, because that also decreases the size. Sounds obvious, but probably not everybody pays the attention for the long running application because one dependency more, several bytes doesn't matter, but here it matters. So other stuff, and now we are t we'll be talking about the static initializer block. So once again, you will receive full CPU cycle for maximal 10 seconds, and then you have to think what can I optimize in this static initializer block. And for example, if you are using DynamoDB or, or uh, all other AWS services, which you have to instantiate, they have this builder pattern that you build, first of all, the client DynamoDB SKS on whatever you use. And it should be built once and then reused in the function itself. So then do this stuff in the static initializer block. Yeah, it will just finish quickly and it's just kind of trade-off. Yeah, you, you do something in the static initializer block which contributes to the call start, but then your warm execution time will be quicker because you don't, you reuse the client simply. So another important point, if you 
instantiate the, the service, AWS requires you to, or it doesn't require you, but, but generally AWS knows where you deploy your function in what region. Yeah, so in case it's in Europe, it may be you central one in Frankfurt or Ireland and so on. AWS can extract these parameters and the same is true also for credentials. How you do you authenticate to the service? There is a concept of credential chain. The AWS may go through the credential chain, which is similar to filter chain and see if there are credentials somewhere, but it takes time for AWS just to figure this out and you know what is the region and you know how you authenticate. So just simply pass that stuff and that it will save uh, up to second only, only doing that stuff and just, uh, it's not documented, it's not enforced, but in that case it saves you time. So another optimization which AWS itself tested, they say probably people who know Java know that there are uh, two levels of um, compilation, client and server. And uh, for example, the server compilation heavily relies on the runtime. So the function will run 10,000 times and then compiler will figure out how, how it should be optimized and it will be de-optimized. And so all, so all uh, that takes of course time because this, this to figure out what to optimize the the thread runs in parallel and it steals your memory, it steals your processor time. But uh, the situation is um, for the short living Lambda function, this optimization, C2 optimization doesn't make too much sense. Yeah, just you don't call to 10,000 times the same Lambda function before the container will be released. So that's, that doesn't make any sense. So if you deploy Lambda, you, you have the possibility to, to, to give Java options there and you can say uh, tiered compilation and, and, and stop at level one. So just don't do this optimization. It doesn't make too much sense, maybe a bit for warm uh, mm, uh, run, but not for the call run. And then you can also save up to 60% on the call side, uh, call start time because nothing interrupts the, this, this, the stuff for the optimization. So we run lots of, so we saw currently that, that, that there are steps, if you pay attention to them, to them you, you may reduce um, your call start, but anyway, these are the best practices just to avoid it any further, like avoid reflection, write time, bytecode generation, avoid proxies, avoid dynamic loss, uh, class loading, and just people using Spring Juice will say, yeah, that's the core of this framework, so I would like to use them as well. And, and, and what should I do this? Yeah. And now, yeah, we will come back to this, but uh, let, let's talk once again about cost optimization techniques. So we talk about this request here. That's nothing language specific. So how many functions uh, have been invoked? It's just that language independent. But now let's talk about the memory. So we say we can double the memory. It will also double the cost. Yeah, double as much memory, double as much cost, but there is also a duration tier, which is also very important. Yeah, and the situation is with uh, with double as much memory, you will get double as much CPU, and that gives you the possibility to optimize so that the code the code runs faster with more CPU. So how can I decide what what is the con the, the perfect configuration for for my memory? Yeah, because in theory. If I double the memory, I double the price, but if the execution time will be f uh, twice as quick, then I will also pay only the half of the execution time and then I pay the same amount, but the function is quicker. So it's, it may be a win yeah, in that situation to double the memory, but to what extent I can do this? And yeah, the simple stuff is you, you should check. Yeah, and this is the Lambda Power Tuning tool from AWS as, uh, itself as, as an open source and it uses also um, um, uh, workflows like step functions There you can simply say, I would like to test and give my function currently half of the gigabyte, gigabyte memory and uh, 256 megabyte and simply just figure out what's the best um, scenario for this and it runs hundreds of times and, and, and outputs your result and the result may look like this. Uh, so you see here 
um, the execution time and you see here this is the red one execution time and you see the execution costs with all this uh, memory configuration that that i gave to test so you can give more and then you see the sweet pot yeah so after this if you give one gigabyte memory you have the best price performance situation so after this if you give two gigabytes memory then you see that execution time hasn't reduced too much but then you see that the cost goes up so it doesn't make any sense so simply test that's the only thing you can do simply test it depends on business logic it depends if it's cpu bound if it's network bound so every function may be different but you cannot guess it, it becomes kind of bit complicated because I told you you can select also ARM as an as a architecture, not only x68. Uh, this graph was the old one. Now you can also just look into the both architectures and, and, and just also decide what architecture you may use. Um, uh, AWS advertises that the ARM architecture costs you 20% low, but figure out yourself so you can simply test. You don't need to trust this and Probably in, in many cases, it doesn't matter for you what architecture. Yeah? It simply it should, it, it should be quick and it should cost as less, as less as possible. So now we saw, okay, how to optimize the code. And so how, can, how we can check the cost and, and just uh, figure out what, what, what memory and price the, the best match is. But generally, Java is well optimized for long running server applications. And that means higher startup times and higher memory utilization and uh, it doesn't matter what we do, we cannot optimize this cold start for Java application um, below second, even seconds. So we cannot go into millisecond uh, area. It doesn't matter what we do. So now we go to the second part. Now Graal VMs enter the scene. I hope everybody knows what, what it is. And it's not the talk is not about the Graal VM itself, but generally just they, they promise low footprint with ahead of time mode for Java based applications, also high performance for all languages, not only JVM based, but we are even for JavaScript, but we are kind of in Java world, uh, even promise a kind of interoperability and polyglot tooling, which doesn't matter for our talk. But anyway, what they also say that uh, Graal VM will only support currently long term versions. So, we can use only Java 11, currently 17 with this. But what is really, really important is this Substrate VM um, part of the Graal VM. It's optional. You can use this, and this Substrate VM adds this ahead of time compilation. And ahead of time compilation, probably you know, this means kind of closed world assumption. So um, you have to find out what, what everything which is reachable from your yeah, lifetime so life cycle from, from, from the execution. Yeah? So you need to find out all reachable methods, fields, and classes, and then pack them, then use ahead of time compilation, and then you have the possibility to create the native image, and so a, nati uh, a native image for each operating system. So you can do this for Mac, uh, Linux, and also Windows. So what this native image brings you exactly uh, what we would like to optimize. These are these cold starts because everything is respect and many things can be even pre-initialized because it's closed world. Nothing should be just no reflection. All the stuff doesn't matter anymore. And of course, the native image it can reduce memory footprint because you only have everything there, nothing, nothing that you don't use. And once again, many things are pre-initialized and so on. You don't have uh, layers in between and so on. And yeah, that's that's kind of stuff that we need for the serverless world with, with trade-offs, of course. But this is something Graal VM native image ahead of time compilation. It brings us closer to the to the to the to, to answer the question how we can just optimize for this uh, call starts and so on. Yeah, it could be easy, but the problem is yeah, AWS doesn't provide. Graal VM native image as a managed runtime. We saw Java 8, Java 11, but you don't see the Graal VM and you don't see Graal VM native image. So how we can bring this? Yeah, I think uh, each cloud provider has the solution. AWS has uh, so-called custom runtime. And what is custom runtime? It's Linux executable. It's only Linux executable. It's very important. But generally, you can create your Graal VM native image then pack this, rename this in the bootstrap, 
pack this into function zip, and then you can just deploy this as, and, and use this custom runtime. And this is the way how you can bring GraalVM native image to AWS with the um, Java code. So just you write lambdas with Java, and then you create a native image, and then deploy this as a custom runtime. Generally, which is really cool uh, for, Graal, for GraalVM, they give you the choice for just-in-time compiler or ahead-of-time compiler. Yeah? For, and, and of course, they have the trade-offs. Just-in-time compiler for classical long-running uh, applications, you see it optimized for peak throughput, reduce maximal latency, and ahead-of-time compiler is optimized for startup speed, for low memory footprint, and also for small packaging. These are these dimensions which are important for um, serverless applications. Of course, ahead of time compiler, to compile it takes time. You will, you will see the statistic, it takes minutes. So this is kind of the downside of this. Yeah? So this, the feedback, developer feedback may suffer. So now see, let's see the statistic. This is kind of typical serverless application. You have API gateway just to, to pass your request through from the outside of the world and you have Lambda function and you have DynamoDB as a NoSQL database. It's this typical setup. And one person simply tested um, uh, with cold starts. And for us, it's only important Java and GraalVM and it's GraalVM native image. It's, you can use GraalVM itself without native image, but this statistic are for native image. So what you see, generally, it's not enough. A very small application, you can start Java with uh, Lambda with Java with 128 megabytes, but generally it's not possible. Uh, here with the quarter of, of gigabyte, you see the statistic. This is for this application, this was the call start, more than six seconds. That was after all the optimization, he cannot go um, lower. But if you use GraalVM, native image, you can, you see, yeah, 700. Uh, 70 milliseconds, and then you can increase memory, you will see that the call start will decrease. But anyway, even with one gigabyte, you have here kind of below three seconds, and you have only half of the second call start for GraalVM native image, which brings us closer to all this uh, Python Node.js stuff. So it doesn't bite too much. So 100 milliseconds, more or less, it doesn't matter, but it does, it's just not, it's not more than in the, in the second area. And this is kind of, th that, that, that is cool because we can leave this call start. So if 0.1% uh, of the invocation takes maximal uh, half of the second, that, that's acceptable. Yeah? So nobody will close the browser <laughs> because of the half of the second uh, in this rare situation. But anyway, um, this is the plain Java situation. Anyway, uh, we, we, we like to use frameworks because they in general increase productivity that gives you sometimes standards like micro profile and so on. And that's of course where there is a problem, there will be kind of solutions. And then you see that the, the, there are frameworks which beyond other stuff that they are also just also developed for microservices world. They had also this serverless situation. So to improve Java for the serverless world from the beginning in mind, like Quarkus and Micronaut, they just the kind of young frameworks and also Spring developers also make their thoughts how to, to improve the stuff. We'll, so now we'll show you some, some examples. I think we have 20 minutes. Um, what is common with these all languages, they rely as, uh, these frameworks, uh, they rely as little as possible on reflection. They don't use anything, all this runtime optimization, they don't do this. They process everything as much as possible that compile time, and then compilation takes longer, and they have common goals. So they just the frameworks are, are there to increase your developer productivity. And in some cases, it's available currently also for Micronode, they try to decrease even call starts uh, um, compared to plain Java solutions. So even the framework on top tries to do optimization with Java itself cannot do. That, that I, I leave you to, to figure out Micronaut um, OT. They, they do also this stuff. So how can we deploy the stuff? So you, we will go through all these frameworks, yeah? 
we should use them. Then GraalVM and native image installation should be where we can use Maver or Gradle. And then we should have AWS CLI and AWS serverless application model tool with this I deploy the serverless application. So these frameworks generate um, the function zip kind of, and then I need to, to have some tool and this is serverless application model to deploy this into AWS world. Yeah, what this will do, that will be to build this Linux executable with GraalVM native image, and then this will be deployed in the function zip this, as, as this custom runtime, as we discussed. So all this, in the end, it doesn't matter what frameworks we do, this will be all this stuff, build the GraalVM native image, pack this into AWS custom runtime, and then deploy with SAM into AWS. So let's start first of all with Quarkus. Uh, this comes from more or less um, IBM Red Hat world. They say it's Kubernetes, nat uh, Kubernetes native. I don't understand this term, to be honest. What is Kubernetes native? I can deploy this on AWS as well. So probably, <laughs> I don't know, another buzzword. But anyway, I can achieve my goals with this framework. And they give two possibilities. I will show you how to write a, um, a Lambda function with the Quarkus. I can simply use um, Spring annotations. So many people know Spring, and then uh, they think, uh, how can I jump into this Quarkus Micronaut world? So Quarkus and also Micronaut gives you the possibility you can simply use um, Spring annotations. Yeah, this is the import comes from um, Spring package. So this, there is nothing Quarkus specific in your code. You see the standard stuff controller. You have request ma uh, mapping with this, some stuff here. So this is the pure, pure Spring code. The magic will come in in the <laughs> Maven then, uh, how it then will be bundled. So the first of all, there is the possibility to create native image with profile native. Yeah, it comes out of the box from, from Quarkus. Yeah, this is the goal native image. And then we can assemble this to, to zip and name this function zip. Then you have different possibilities. You can build GraalVM native image, but they give you also the possibility that you create that you start uh, use Docker and then build Docker um, native image. So if you are in, 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 on your own um, yeah, developer uh, machine, then you can use simply Docker and they, they install the GraalVM, GraalVM native image and provide all the isolation. So you don't rely on what installed on, on your machine. So they will simply create Docker environment with everything needed and everything is out of the box here with the Quarkus. I really prefer this op option native container instead of native, pure native, because I have a lot of stuff here which probably uh, is not in the right version on my own machine and the, the magic will, will be done automatically. And then of course, with, uh, this is another stuff from the POM XML. So this is here, the, the magic Quarkus Amazon Lambda HTTP. This is how this Quarkus code will be kind of proxy to Lambda. Yeah, this is all this stuff is made, uh, handled with this one dependency. And this is Quarkus Spring Web. This, this is for, um, for processing the Spring annotations. So that Spring annotation will be converted to Quarkus code. Yeah, and that's it. Then you will run it. It will take more than three minutes and then you have your native image. Uh, so this function zip. Yeah, then there's a lot of ma magic which is completely um, kind of um, hidden for us. And this is for, for, for people using this um, Soros application model. You can use cloud formation, if you will, or cloud development kit. It doesn't matter how you deploy this. But with uh, SAM, I can define where this function uh, code is, which I would like to deploy. This is then after the Maven uh, has done his job, is in the target function zip. Then I should provide HTTP API or REST API URL kind of pattern. The URL will be generated from AWS myself. Yeah, this is the function. This is the HTTP API for this. So I can call this with curl or from outside of the world. And then I can simply say SAM deploy and say this is this YAML template, native YAML. And then after this will be deployed, you will see the output of the HTTP API URL. This is simply URL that you can curl this, you can use pets 5 and kind of what we wrote on, on the last slide. So very cool. So very, very little code and just you can do this stuff and, and it works really perfectly. So there are also additional features. I, I have the example there, but for the sake of time, um, you can use also this um, request handler. So you don't need to use um, 
Spring annotations, you can use this um, Amazon request handler and then implement handle request method instead. You can use then for your services, for your beans, the micro profile annotations because Quarkus understands this. So this is up to you. You can use Spring, you can use Quarkus own stuff with, uh, with that. It doesn't support Java 8 functional interface, which plain Java supports. Uh, but anyway, you can use website. This is similar to uh, Spring initializer. They can simply generate everything that you need on dependencies. You simply select them. Um, and you can also use Quarkus CLI, which gives you one abstraction more. So you don't, then you simply do Quarkus create app. Yeah, you can de define Quarkus, Amazon, Lambda extension and POM XML, or for Azure, you can use Azure extension, and then you can build the application with Quarkus, um, com uh, with this command line. What it gives you that even same template, which I showed you will be generated for you. So in the end, you simply, you don't need to write anything, you can deploy this. That it's very handy if you use the CLI, it gives, it's just, uh, uh, frees you up from 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 writing the templates. It understands everything. You will have all the same stuff uh, stuff generated and so on, and then simply deploy it to AWS cloud. Yeah, it's micro profile compatible, as as I told you. There is also Funky for multi cloud solution. I will leave it out. I don't believe in multi cloud solution. It may be for your use case, but in order to build knowledge in one cloud provider, it takes huge time. And I don't know why people using two of them uh, for the sake of compatibility, but we don't migrate generally. But that, there, are, there may be cases. So let's jump into the micronode. The, the, the founder of Micronaut is Jem Roche. Uh, probably everybody knows him from, from Groovy stuff. Interestingly, he um, now is working for Oracle. So I will assume that there will be some kind of cooperation between Oracle, which is interested in Java and Micronaut. And I see people from AWS in the advisory board of Micronaut. So I, I, I will assume that the um, AWS will invest more in Micronaut because IBM Red Hat invests in Quarkus. That's kind of this competitive situation. And probably Azure is also in the world of Quarkus. So then AWS needs to invest in something else. Um, but anyway, um, Micronaut goes, this the similar framework, but they go their own way. They don't support any micro profile standard uh, now, but they provide their own similar to Spring annotation models. You see controller, you see post, you see get. Very, very similar, but these are pure Micronaut annotations uh, as, as one of the possibilities. You can also use Spring annotations for this, but generally the example is also you don't see any dependencies to AWS and um, onto Lambdas and so on. And the same stuff here, the, the magic comes with POM XML. You see here Micronaut function, AWS API proxy dependency, which will proxy your code then to AWS Lambda. And there's also dependency to custom runtime. And the same as for Quarkus, you have the choice. You can build the native image, yeah, simply GraalVM native image. You can build simple Docker image without Graal, GraalVM, or you can have Docker native. This is kind of Docker environment within GraalVM, and then the native image of this environment will be built. Um, so for the sake of isolation and all other advantages of Docker. Also the same stuff. So as I told you, I showed you the example of, of um, code with uh, Micronaut own annotation. You can use also Spring annotations for this. The same stuff, you, you, you have the website and CLI, both possibilities. You have custom validators and so on. Uh, there is no standard support like MicroProfile and also there is Micronaut IoT. So you can figure out what is it simply compile time optimi optimization, which gives you more performance in the, in the execution phase. But also very nice framework, uh, bit of young, but uh, very good performance and I think lots, uh, lots of potential. So the last one is, yeah, the Spring world. And of course you can imagine that uh, the Spring, which relies heavily on this reflection stuff, they, have, they, they don't want to lose Java developers, they want to offer this, but they have kind of heavy job to do. Yeah, because just they have to, to rewrite a lot of stuff and they, they have this Spring GraalVM native project, which will be released with Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6 in, in end of the, this year, as they promise, it's currently in the beta. 
and they provide kind of the same um, uh, capabilities as this native project the name says they will provide GraalVM native stuff um, just to give you the option to stay within completely the spring framework and use then um, the, the, the stuff for the serverless application. This is one of the examples. It's a bit complicated how it currently works with Spring, but anyway, you need to de declare one class, which is Spring Boot Application Annotation. And then how you do this, this is the same template where I can define the function. I say this is the handler is get book by ID, and then it will be mapped to this function with the same name of this up, uh, with this class, with this annotation. That gives you the possibility to instantiate another class where you <laughs> write your business logic. In the end, you see this is the business logic where I, the input is something from API Gateway, and then that output is also the response something from the API Gateway, but anyway, it will be instantiated kind of here. Yeah, it gives you a lot of flexibility because for each HTTP method for POST, for GET, uh, and so on, you can define your own function, which then points to different class so that your Lambda function uh, remains single purpose. And yeah, then if you execute this template, the API uh, gateway URL will be generated. And as you see, yeah, this is, you, you declare this path book ID, and this ID will be bind here to the path parameter and then can be used here with book five here in this URL. So this is kind of a bit complicated mapping, but it gives you a lot of flexibility to write um, single purpose uh, Java functions. So in the end, it's, the poem looks the same, kind of uh, you see the same stuff, native goal in the poem. Yeah, you build here function zip and all these dependencies to AWS world to Spring Native are declared simply in the in the POM itself. You see, it's Spring Cloud function, Spring Cloud function adapter adapter AWS. So all the, the same pattern, the magic is is in the POM. So to wrap it up, uh, interesting AWS Lambda. I could make it only work with this Java functional interface. We saw that it implemented function this uh, Lambda. It doesn't work with request handler and for the, it doesn't work with the Spring annotation. It's kind of funny that Quarkus and Micronaut work both with Spring annotation, but the Spring native doesn't work currently with Spring annotation. Maybe they will fix it currently as an exception in the Lambda if it doesn't implement function interface. So I tried it, I didn't make it work. Maybe it will work today, but uh, currently I didn't. So some statistic in the end to compare the stuff, somebody compared, um, in both cases he used GraalVM, but in the first case, he used Java for, for writing uh, Lambda, so plain Java. In the second case, he used Quarkus on top of this. In, in both cases, GraalVM native image was built. Maybe it's a bug, maybe it will be fixed, but you see that adding this, at least Quarkus, um, on top of, yeah, uh, adds something. So for example, compilation time, 25% more, just only by adding framework, yeah? You see three minutes, for GraalVM it's itself, it's, 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 it, it, yeah, it just breaks a bit of um, feedback cycle because you have to wait, but just adding the framework adds also 50 seconds. You also saw that the call start in case, yeah, you will probably select half of the um, gigabyte memory or, the, or even a bit more, but then you see it also adds a bit to the call start. Yeah, So without using Quarkus, it was bit better, it's still below one second, which is good, but anyway, maybe it will be fixed, but you see that the framework may also add, it adds productivity, but it may bite you on the other hand. But this is maybe this kind of the situation which may, which can be fixed. Um, another stuff, uh, also this is the test for typical serverless application, lots of Lambda API gateway, then you have DynamoDB, somebody tested um, all three frameworks with Java without GraalVM, completely without GraalVM, simple Java, you can write the code without GraalVM, and then they use the same code with the same frameworks with GraalVM native image, just to see, and yeah, you see this typical situation uh, when you use especially DynamoDB and so on, call starts are huge and with the Java world without GraalVM, and then you see that the GraalVM simply cuts them, cuts them a lot. So they are half of the second, depending, you see here different P, uh, P90 and so on. So 
Uh, but what's important here to see, and it's something that I hear from many people, that the Quarkus is kind of superior. They have the, the lowest cold starts currently. And Micronaut is a bit behind, and Spring Boot is also a bit behind Micronaut. But I should say that the Spring Boot, Spring Native Boot, uh, has improved a lot. As I tested this last year, uh, the cold starts of the Spring Native uh, were beyond one second. So they cut it. 50%. So they currently also going to direction there, it becomes acceptable and they had really hard job to do to, to, to make it work anyway. But just you see that this, that maybe this can change all the time, but the, the, the values are acceptable and it's really up to you to, to select what, what framework you use, uh, taking to the account that Spring uh, Native is currently in the beta phase, but will change in the end of the year, hopefully. So I have only several seconds, <laughs> I would say. So there is another possibility to deploy the stuff. For example, you can currently deploy also container, Docker container image with your Lambda function. So without GraalVM, simply you have Docker container possibility. Uh, what it gives you, um, more or less, you can use the US Java version, which you would like, because uh, manage Java only for long term, GraalVM is also for long term, with Docker you can do what you want. Yeah, you can just do the stuff with Java 18. Yeah, you don't have the GraalVM, but anyway, then if you say, Three, I have waited three years and that there is no long-term version supported currently in Lambda. I just don't want to, mix, do, to miss six versions of Java. Then you can go uh, use the Docker option and then you uh, use the, the newest version. It gives you also other stuff, which is quite interesting. Uh, you can build your G um, Java virtual machine with only dependencies that you really need. Yeah, the, the tool JDEPS can investigate the function and see do you use SQL and so on. And you have Java modules, yeah, so they can, uh, and then you can use JLink and only build the runtime that contains on, only the stuff that you really need. You can also use class data sharing feature, it comes, I think, Java, from Java 13. So with the Docker, you have other optim optimization techniques. You don't have the native image stuff, but you can use all this funny stuff and important stuff which comes with these versions in between. Yeah, so just as another area of optimization, then you can just do, create a smaller GVM with less uh, artifact size and also optimize there. So maybe last minute's conclusion, all these frameworks are powerful. GraalVM is also powerful and GraalVM improves cold starts and memory footprint, but it's not without challenges. Yeah, so AWS run uh, Lambda runtime requires Linux to build because AWS requires it. Um, building custom runtimes requires initial effort. So think it, it takes, it's memory intensive. It takes three seconds. You have a lot of Lambda functions. You need to think how to scale CI job to build this. Yeah, because then you will wait a lot. Yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's then up to you. Build time is a factor. And what is important, I said this init phase for 10 seconds is for free, but only for managed runtime. It's not free for custom runtime. And it's not free for Docker. It adds a bit to your cost. It's not too much, but it adds. Um, so my personal recommendation is that's the last slide. Start with a plain Java without um, um, GraalVM. Yeah? Use the long-term version. You can use on top also without GraalVM, Micronaut, or Quarkus. If you don't want to miss years of innovation, then use Docker container. In case you say, I need constantly low response times, and also then you can use also kind of provision concurrency that you can define how many warm containers run within specific time frame. If you know this time frame, that's very important yeah, for the known period of time. You can pay for these warm containers and they will run. That will reduce the call start because they are warm, but you need to think how many of them do you need. If you really need the constant low response time and the cost is a factor, then you should take a look at the GraalVM native image with or without the images. So without, uh, otherwise you will, you will have all this um, call starts. Yeah, and you saw that Quarkus added something up <laughs> uh, to the call starts. Micronode optimizes this, it may change, but you have to think, okay, this framework gives the productivity, but what, what they take away from me? Yeah, what's the trade-off? There are a lot of links that you can download the application and try yourself. So I will post the slides on SlideShare and so on. And that's it, <laughs> two minutes, so it's a bit... <laughs>
yeah, sorry, I know you have to go to another room for another talk, but I hope it was interesting so you can engage with me on LinkedIn and, and on Twitter and ask questions afterwards. I will share the presentation and all that stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.